in church taught me to hate the sin but love the sinner lately I've been noticing a change the church is getting thinner we are not consuming enough lost souls to cause the church to grow and I think that we should know God loves you God loves me God loves the drunkard down the street He loves the woman who divorced her man and left her family so loved the world he gave up his son for one like me the apostle John he wrote that through that same love we could all be free I don't want to take a chance and miss the message that God gives. And I know that message is God loves you, God loves me, God loves the drunkard down the street. He loves the woman who divorced her man and left her family. the drunkard down the street. He loves the woman who divorced her man and left her family. He loves prisoners and thieves and those filled with Whether we're right or wrong, he loves us all. Of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, isn't it wonderful to be here today? Man, it is great to see everybody here. I, I kind of feel like we have been apart for so long that, uh, you know, but it's only been a week, right? But it's great to be here together. Uh, you know, as we join together in one heart and one mind, 
Uh, let's uh, go ahead and go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, dear Lord, so much for this day. God, we thank you for this time that you have given to us to be able to come into your house and to praise and to worship you. And God, as we join together with one heart, with all the ones across this uh, you know, city that's, that we are in, God, I pray, dear Lord, that you would join with each one of us as we sing together and as we praise you, the only one that is worthy. And God, that I pray that you would receive it as a sweet incense unto you because this is your day. This is the day that we come to glorify you and to praise you. And God, we do that in word and in song. And we pray to you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we come together and as we praise and worship God corporately, as well as individually, I'm going to ask that you would stand this morning and join us in our praise and worship. Good morning, everyone. It is good to be back in church. Amen. Are you blessed today? Amen. Because he lives, we got something to go for in it. Because he lives, it's why we're here today. Amen. Sing with me this morning, would you? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Because he Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. God sent his son. Call him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the come assured. This child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. Life 
Think about I'll cross that river, I'll find life's fine, no more with pain. And then as death is way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know He Aren't you glad for that today? We can face all the troubles of life every day because he lives. You know, because he lives, we have victory. And Jesus, no matter where we go or what we say, we have victory. You know, it doesn't matter what the devil says or what the enemy says. He's already, <laughs> he's already done for. He's already defeated. I done read the last chapter, folks. We win. No matter what happens. I, done let, I read the last chapter. I know what's going to happen. Because the victory in Jesus this morning, that he's because he lives. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be here this morning. It's good to be in this crowd. We have a great crowd. Sing this old hymn with me. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory My Savior forever He sought me and He bought me With His redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew Him And all my love is to Him He plunged me to victory Beneath the cleansing flood I heard about His healing Of His cleansing power revealing How He made the lame to walk again And caused the blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. To victory beneath the cleansing flood. If it wasn't for the victory, you know, where would we be? Amen. We have victory over all sin. He assured us that. That's a promise of God. That's one of His promises to have victory in our hearts. We don't have to go around being defeated no more. We can have victory in our hearts. You know that? Well, praise God. He's good to us, isn't he? 
Amen. Sing this last verse with me. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He punched me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. We have victory this morning, folks. <laughs> and the longer I serve him, all oh, the sweeter he grows. The longer I've been a Christian, each day just gets a little sweeter. A lot of us think, oh, this, this disease is going around now. It's not, it's not going to defeat us, folks. We have victory in Christ. And the sweeter, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows each day. No matter what. If I die tomorrow and go to heaven, I've already, I've defeated him. Amen. I've defeated the devil. But the sweeter he grows each day in my heart when I'm still here. Amen. Oh, we have a God that loves us so much, folks. I've been fastened up for about six months now. And my heart is about to overflow. I love him this morning. Sing this song with me. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls since I gave my heart to Jesus the longer I serve him the sweeter he grows every need he is supplying plenteous grace he bestows every day my way gets brighter the longer I serve him the sweeter he grows the longer I serve him the sweeter he grows the more that I love him more love Days like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Amen. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. You know, that's true. When you've been fastened up for about six months and you... <laughs> Me and Susan talk. But I like to talk to him too. I get on my knees and start talking to him. I say, Lord, whatever is your will, no matter what's going on in this world, whatever your will is, that's what I want to do. And he's here this morning, folks. Oh, he's here. 
I can feel him, can't you? I can feel him in the air. He is here. Sing this song. He is here. Hallelujah. He is here. Amen. He is here. Holy, holy. I will bless his name again. He is here. Listen closely. Hear him calling out your name. He is here. You can touch him. You will never be the same. He is here. Hallelujah. He is here. Amen. He is here. Holy, holy. I will bless his name again. He is here. Listen closely. Hear him calling out your name. He is here, you can touch him, you will never be the same. Amen. He is here this morning, isn't he? He has graced us with his presence. As we open up our hearts and as we bow before him, we come to him this morning with praise. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. And we do thank you for being here with us. God, we thank you for your spirit. And God, and how he is moving in our midst. And God, right now as we come to you, you know, God, we, we lay down our burdens. God, we call upon you. We give you our struggles but God we also give you our praise God we cry out to you from the struggles that we live in in this world but God we thank you for this world that we live in God right now there are people in this congregation there are people that are watching us and God their hearts are aching and God I pray that you would meet them right there And God, that they would receive your touch of peace and mercy. And God, that you would give them courage and you would give them strength. And God, there's those that are here today that are watching. God, that feel unworthy to even be in your presence. God, I pray that your loving arms would wrap around them. And that they would feel your love and your mercy. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you would go out and that you would draw us to you and God the spirit that is here in our midst God that we would allow it to transform our lives God I pray as your humble servant I bow before you God I pray that you would hide me behind your cross God I pray that the words that are spoken this morning are your words And God, I pray the words that are spoken this morning are spoken with power, not mine, but by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that those words would move and that they would transform. In Jesus' name, amen. He is here, hallelujah. He is here, amen. name again he is here listen closely hear him calling out your name he is here you can touch
to have Kelly and them. Y'all may be seated. It's great to have Kelly and them to, uh, you know, with us today and to sing. It's good to have Susan and John on the uh, piano for us and Carter and Courtney singing. We thank them for that. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a whole lot easier to preach whenever you have a group that ushers in the Spirit and brings us to the throne of God. This morning, I want us to go back into that unfamiliar passage of Scripture that we were dealing with last week, and that's Habakkuk, the prophet of Habakkuk, and we're going to look and see what he has for us today. Today, we're going to go to chapter 3, so go ahead and turn into, your, uh, into the Bible and go ahead and go to Habakkuk chapter 3, and we're going to talk about that whole passage of Scripture but we're going to focus in on verses 2 and then verses 17 through 19. But as we go there, I want to take you back to where we were last Sunday because last Sunday we looked at Habakkuk chapter 1 and we talked about chapter 1 all the way through chapter 2 and last Sunday's message was entitled, What's Wrong With This Picture?, So this Sunday's message is entitled, What is Still Wrong with This Picture? Because we're going to bring these things together, and in the world that we're living in today, there is still something wrong with this picture. And what is wrong with this picture is, is that we are in this already but not yet stage, because whenever Jesus Christ came on this earth, He said that, and he proclaimed the message that the kingdom of God is at hand. But yet it's still not there because we are still on this earth and we are still living in turmoil and we are still living in strife and our body is still this human and earthly body. So we're in there, we're in the already but not yet part. So there's still something wrong with this picture. This message this morning is going to be dealing about God's or dealing with God's love for us. As we look at God's love for us and what it looks like, a lot of times it's different than what we think it should be. To kind of help you out with this, I want to give you some things. And the first thing that I want to tell you is that this message is not for your neighbor. This message is for you. So don't look at your neighbor Don't look at your spouse. This message is for you. Whenever we do this, I also want to kind of help you along with this because there's things in our lives that help us out and that points to things that God wants us to learn. So I want to take you back to my life and to my childhood. Now, I grew up in a little town just outside of Baton Rouge called Baker, And I had a friend that lived down the street from me. He was about five, six houses from me. We lived on a dead-end road. So if you went to the house, you went there on purpose. It wasn't that you accidentally made the wrong turn. If you did, you were going to turn around pretty quick. So, uh, you know, we have this. And this is the friend that I grew up and I went to school with him from kindergarten all the way up to 10th grade whenever I moved off, went to a private school. But we were still there next door to each other or close by. This is one of those friends that whenever I walked outside of the house, we had this scream that we would do or we had this noise that we would make. And if he was outside, he would echo it back to me. And then we would meet somewhere in the middle. This is the friend that taught me how to bake, fry, uh, you know, roast, whatever you want to call it, tadpoles. We would get up early on a Saturday and we would head out into the woods and we would catch little tadpoles and we would lay them on tin foil and set it out in the sun and about two or three hours later, we would come by and we would eat those tadpoles. So that's the kind of friend this was. We did everything together. One day we were, you know, um, I was sitting on the bus. I got on the bus to go home early 
And all of a sudden, he comes running on the bus. And I notice that there's a blood stain on his leg, on his pants leg. And as he passes me, there's this bigger gentleman that jumps on the bus. And I'm like, whoa, that's not good. So I stood up in the aisle way in between my friend and this other guy. He backed off the bus. It most probably wasn't because I was any bigger or anything like that than my friend. I might have looked uglier than him. But anyway, that's the kind of friend that he was. Peggy and I, so I moved off and went off to college. And I met my wife. And we get married. Now, remember, I'm from Louisiana. And we're in North Carolina getting married. So I had picked a friend or picked someone here in North Carolina to be my best man. And on the night of rehearsal, he doesn't show up. So I have to find another best man. So I pick my dad. Now this friend that I'm talking about, Eric. He made the trip with my family. He drove up all the way from Baker, Louisiana, 14 and a half some odd hours to be there with me during this time. And I picked my dad to be my best man. I can remember and I can picture that wedding day. And as I look out and see in that audience, in that backyard of that wedding crowd, I see my best friend standing there with his sunglasses on. And today I can imagine the tears rolling down his face. See, I was in such of a hurry to leave that life behind that I left behind the best friend that I've ever had. I haven't heard from him in over 32 years. We have a best friend in God. And there's times that we choose not to allow him to be that best friend. But there's also times in our lives that we can look back at it. I look at now. It took me about five years after being married with Peggy to think back to that day. Say, man, I missed that. I missed that opportunity. Do I wish that that friend would ever reach back out to me? Yeah. But see, this is going to match up because in chapter 1 of Habakkuk, verse 2, we find that Habakkuk is crying out to God. And he is saying, how long must I call out to you? How long must I cry to you before you're going to come and rescue me? How long? And then after this, he talks about the violence and he talks about all the things that's going on in the world that he wants God to protect him from or to remove him from the violence, the corruption. He wants him to remove him from all of this. He says, how long must I look upon it? And then God's reply. What was God's reply? You remember last week? God says, okay, I'll take care of this. But the way that I'm going to take care of this is that I'm going to send the Babylonian army to come in and take over the Israelites. To come in and to take over and begin to rule over you. In our layman's term today, we would simply look at God and say, whoa, wait a minute. That is not what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to take me away from this. I didn't want you to bring upon more troubles. I wanted you to take me away from all of this. So whenever we look at this today and we look in chapter 3, let's look at verse 2. Because in verse 2 it changes because chapter 1, it's his lament. 
He is crying out to God. He is in deep anguish and he is concerned with God and he is crying out and praying and calling out to him. But we find in verse 3, that it, or in chapter 3, that it changes. In verse 2, it says, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing work. In this time of, your de- of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger... Remember your mercy. So whenever we first look at this, it's no longer a lament. He's no longer praying and asking God to remove him from the violence. He is no longer asking God to straighten out the wicked people. Remember in there he even says that the wicked people outnumber the good. He's not crying out and calling out for that anymore. What is he doing? In this process, in this dialogue, in this conversation, conversation that he has had with or is having with God, his cries has now turned to praise. His cries has now turned to worshiping God. Instead of calling for him to rescue them, he is calling out and he is worshiping him because he is what? My Savior. In this, we find that he reveals God to the people or he calls out to God and he says, God, reveal your work and your will to the people. I want you to see this. It says, help us again, as you did in the years gone. Help us again. Recall the things that he has brought you from. Recall recall the destruction that was in your life. Recall the time that you felt unworthy to be in his presence. And what did he do? Recall the struggle that you had. You remember that financial difficulty that you had two, three years ago? And how he's brought brought you from that? Remember that day whenever you were struggling and whenever someone in your past as a child, whenever he came to you and you were abused, by an adult. You remember that day? God says, I have you. God says, in the midst of that struggle, I was still there with you. That day that you lost your job, I was right there with you. And I was providing for you. And I was protecting you. You remember that time whenever you chose to to go out partying and you got a little drunk and you wrecked your car? God was there with you. You remember that time whenever you got drunk and the cop pulled you over and you got a DWI? You remember that time whenever you woke up And you had no clue on whose house you were in. Or what woman was laying next to you. God was there. God was there. He was protecting us. You remember that time whenever you dropped to your knees. And he asked for forgiveness of your sins. <laughs> and his love and mercy came rushing in. See, that's what Habakkuk is saying. He's saying, remember those times. 
But the thing is, is that he was telling God. He says, God, remember these times. He's telling God so that we allow God to know, I saw that. It took me five years to realize what I had done to my friend. I hope it doesn't take you that long to tell God thank you for what he's done for you. I hope it doesn't take you that long to thank God for the struggle that he took you through last week, last month, last year. I hope it doesn't take you that long to thank God for the kids that he blessed you with regardless of where they are. Regardless if they're following Christ or if they're out into the world. Thank God for the kids that he's given to you, to your children. When was the last time you've done that? When was the last time that you thanked God for your spouse? Was it whenever she made you a delicious dinner? Or was it whenever you just simply woke up and rolled over and realized that the one next to you was placed there by God to help you in your times of need? I I know there are people in this world that struggle. God has a plan for all of us. God is sovereign. There are times in our lives that we feel that we married the wrong person. God is still with you in the midst of that battle. We just don't like to thank him for the struggles. We don't like to thank him for the bad choices that we've made that he has so graciously brought us through. I ask this question. I want you to remember the story of the prodigal son. And in the story of the prodigal son, I would ask you the question, when does the father show the son that he loves him? Is it whenever he comes back home and the father puts the ring on him and puts the new robe and gives him sandals? Does the father just show him love then? Or does the father show him love whenever he gives him his inheritance before he even dies and allows him to go out into the world? Does the parable not show God's love or the Father's love for the Son whenever it says that He saw His Son coming off from a distance, giving us the understanding that most probably every single day or every time He walked by that window that He looked out down that road to see if His Son was not coming home? The Father loved the Son the same from the beginning of that parable all the way to the end of the parable. He loved him by giving him the option and giving him the choice to go out into the world and to live his life the way that he deemed it. The father could have looked at the son and said, no, I'm not going to give you your inheritance. You're going to have to stay here and work. But see, the father was looking for more than just simply a ruler or a relationship that was dominated by if you do this I will bless you or if you do this I will give you this he wanted a relationship with his son that regardless of what it looked like that he knew his father loved him Habakkuk gets there Habakkuk says God thank you for the struggles And he asked God to reveal himself to us. There again, 
If you didn't see what the work of God, if you didn't see the amazing things, remember in chapter 1, if you didn't see the amazing things that God was was doing, you wouldn't recognize it. Now, he says, God, I see you at work now. He says, I see your awesome, amazing work in this time in our deep need. But wait a minute. There's still something wrong with this picture. What's wrong with this picture? We're still struggling. There's still issues that's out there. So let me take you back to the other passages of Scripture that we worked with last week. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. Moses takes the Israelites away from the Red Sea and into the wilderness. Took 40 years to get Egypt out of the Israelites. 40 years for them to wander around into the desert and to understand that God wanted to provide for them and to protect them. To give them every single thing that they needed. Before they enter into the promised land, Joshua stands up and Joshua says, As far as for me and my house, we will praise the Lord. The Israelites call out and they say, We will worship the Lord as well. And he says, No, you can't. You can't. Why not? Because you're still worshiping the gods that you had on the other side of the Euphrates River. We cannot worship God the way that He truly has for us to worship Him because we're still worshiping the same gods as we worshiped on the other side of salvation. Whoa, wait a minute. Hey, Wood, I need your help, brother. This is He's calling us and He's telling us. He says, for me to be your God, you're going to have to trust that regardless of what it looks like, I am providing for you and I am protecting you. And I am your God and you can trust me to love you with all that I am. But we can't do it because we're so caught up into the world because of where we were before He accepted us as as, as we accepted Him as our Savior. He told him that. He said, you can't do this. You cannot worship God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength because you haven't turned the list of those other gods. Because we look at God and we tell God that you love me whenever I'm doing good or I'm doing good and you're loving me whenever you're blessing me. But whenever I'm going through a struggle... You're not blessing me, and I've done something wrong. It's like somebody, a lot of people should say, come on now. Because we do it. My earthly father loved me to the most, to the most of his ability. But I want you all to know, whenever he passed away just over a year ago, I struggled with that. I struggled with the fact that my dad showed me that he loved me whenever I was playing sports. But whenever it had to do with school, he didn't love me. Now he loved me. But I tell you what, whenever I got that report card and it had those D's and F's on it, that belt didn't look like love coming across my rear end. And that belt from God, whenever we do what's wrong, whenever we are not receiving the blessings that we feel that we should be receiving, we take it as punishment and He no longer loves us. Instead of understanding that He loves us regardless of what we're going through. His love will never change for us. He loves us in the struggles and He loves us in the blessings. He loves us. There are even those that are here today that's watching that we don't feel like we deserve to be loved. 
We don't feel like we deserve to be loved because of all the things that we've done. God just brought this into my mind, so I've got to give it to you. So, I'm in fifth grade, first day of school, get there with all my buddies and all my friends, new kid, standing over there by himself, leaned up against the pole before school starts. My friends look at me, and they go, John, I bet you won't go hit him. What did I do? And I went and doubled him over. Turned around and walked straight to the principal's office. I knew I was wrong. Now you're like, Pastor, that really, that's just simply hitting somebody in the stomach. He didn't deserve it. He didn't even know it was coming. Now I've done some worse things than that, and I'm not going to tell you those. But I will let you know that God still loves me. I will let you know that God still died on that. Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive me of all of those things. Regardless of how bad it is. None of us are worthy of his love, but he gives it to us anyway. And that's why Habakkuk says here, remember us in your anger and pour out your mercy upon us. Because I know I've done bad. But don't forget, don't forget your mercy upon me. Do you see this? Do you see the change? Habakkuk crying out and saying, God, I need you to work. God, I need you to get me out of all this. God, I need you to save me. God, I need you to relieve me from this violence. God, I need you to take care of all the wickedness in this world. To saying, God, thank you. Thank you for all the things that you've done before. Thank you for all the things that you're going to do. But thank you for working in my life right now. Thank you for what you have done and given to me right now. He says, I can see you at work right now. It's not just the stories of the crystal sea and the streets of gold and the mansion that he has prepared for us. It's not just those. It's what he has now. But now let's move on because in verse 17, it goes in and it says, though the fig trees do not bloom and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the field produces no food, there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Well, wait a minute. If there's none of this stuff, then you're pretty much homeless and you're starving, right? But then he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Whew. Regardless of what's happened, even if you feel as low as low and you don't feel worthy of His love, your world has fallen apart. He says, Rejoice. Be joyful. But why? Why? Because of my Savior. My Savior. Your Savior. Because He is at work right now. In the time and the place that we're in. I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're struggling this morning. I don't know if for some reason Satan has come in and you were actually doubting whether or not you were worthy of salvation. I don't know if you have a financial issue that you're dealing with. 
I don't know if you're like 95% of the people and you're struggling with this safe space. And you're struggling with all the other stuff that's going on in this world. Because in these days, we're supposed to be praising God. We are supposed to be worshiping God Almighty because He is at work. Do you see it? It's not that He's worked in the past and He's going to work in the future. But He's at work right now. And we rejoice within that work. We don't rejoice within the struggle, but we rejoice because He is in control of all of it. And it's not whether I'm doing good today or I did bad yesterday that we gauge His love for us. His love is always the same. And that love is more and deeper and wider than we could ever comprehend. He gave His Son to die on the cross whenever we were at our worst because He loved us. Because He loved us. So through this, we look at this and we look at this journey. We've done it and we do it. We call out and we cry out to God to remove us from this circumstance. To give us His peace. To have His peace to take over in the midst of the struggles. We praise God. In the midst of our blessings, we praise God. Whenever we can barely walk, we praise God. Whenever we're laying on our back, we praise God. Whenever we're knocking on death's door, we praise God. Whenever we're diagnosed with a disease, we praise God. Whenever we break our leg, we praise God. Whenever everything else is taken away, we praise God. Because He is... I'm going to have to... We'll have to work on this here. Okay, so I'm going to give you these two words, and whenever I do like this, I want you to repeat those two words, okay, my Savior. So we do all of this because you got to say this loud enough so the people on the internet can hear you. We do this because, amen, because of my Savior, because He promises that He will provide for us and that He will protect us regardless of what the world says. And regardless of what we're going through, God is in control and He loves each and every one of us. He asks us to ask for forgiveness, to turn from our wicked ways and to follow and to trust in Him. And He will provide for us. He will provide for us in these days. Not in yesterday's, not in tomorrow's, but in these days. These days. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for these words today. God, I thank you for being here with us. God, I pray, dear Lord, that your face would shine upon us. And God, that you will bless each one that is here. Again, God, I thank you for this message and for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't want to go away.